Okay, we're on uh, Parshas Chukas. So this is the Parsha of the Pura Duma. But before we even start there, take a look at the last words. Take a look at the last, if, take a look at the first words of the Parsha. Adabra Hashem HaMoshe Ra'alei Mor Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the statute of the Torah, Asher Tziva Hashem Lei Mor. Page 838. So, uh, take a para aduma, red cow, which is unblemished, and it has now yoke that went on it, and give it to Allah Zerah coin. And then the Pesach is going to talk about the entire process. They take this red cow, and they, 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 they burn the red cow. They burn the red cow, and they, what do you call it, they, uh, they put it on... Uh, uh, anybody who become, came into, became Tame uh, with a dead body, who came into contact with a dead body, gets spray, sprinkled with the ashes of the red cow that are mixed in with water. And we don't have a red cow nowadays because we don't have, uh, uh, we're Tame. Therefore, anybody who is, uh, every, we are all assumed to be Tame Mace. We are all presumed to be Tame Mace. Because and we cannot get out of Tamei Mace nowadays because we don't have a Paraduma nowadays, which is why you can't go up on the Temple Mount. And those that do, according to the biggest post scheme, are Chayev Kores, which is a premature death because you're not allowed to walk into the Temple area in a state of Tuma, in a state of uh, ritual impurity, which they are, which we are, and therefore you can't. Don't ask me why they do. Uh, that they, I'm not responsible for what people do. I'm only responsible for what people should do. I'm not even responsible for what I do. I'm only responsible for what I should do. So, and even that, I'm not so responsible. So that, that, that's the that's what the that's what the halacha says. Okay. Now, do you know the story of David Melech? What happened to King David when he was born? What happened to King David when he was uh, not when he was born when he was supposed to die? How did he die? Anybody know what the Gemara says? David Amel said to Hashem, when am I going to die? Hashem said, I don't tell anybody. I don't tell people when they're going to die. So I said, he asked again. So Hashem said, I only tell you this, you're going to die in Shabbos. So what did he do? Every Shabbos, what did he do? He learned Torah nonstop. The Nam of the Malcham is the angel of death can't get at you when you're learning Torah. Torah protects. And then eventually what he did was he made a decision. He, he created a, 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 some sort of... A, uh, he distracted him by making noise, and David Melch started got up to check what was the noise in the backyard, and he, the stair broke, and he fell, and he died. That's what the Gemara says in Shabbos. The David, that's how the, what's funny about that? Yeah, pretty interesting way to drill. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they couldn't get at him otherwise. He was being protected because he was learning. I, I, you know, I, whatever that means, that the Malcolm, you know, some people ask, well, didn't he make Kiddush? Didn't he go to the bathroom? I mean, well, you know, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Apparently, that doesn't count. If you're only learning Torah and you have to go to the bathroom, so apparently that's also part of Torah. Part of Torah is going to the bathroom. You know, the Gemara says that Rabbi Akiva followed his Rebbe into, ba- into the bathroom to see how he conducts himself in the bathroom. Gemara says, you, you what? to see how he behaved in the bathroom. He followed him into the bathroom. Hey, you did what? He said, Torah, he's a little mud on it. It's Torah, I got to learn it. That's also part of Torah. How to behave in the bathroom is part of Torah. You know, it's a, it's an, you know you're apprenticing. So, so he went and he followed it. The Gemara says that Rav Kahana was underneath the bed where, where Rav was living with his wife. He said, Kahana, you didn't get out. What are you doing here? This is not discreet. He said, Torah, he will mind. That's also part of Torah. It's also part of Torah. Okay, we're talking about people who are, you know, beyond our comprehension. Beyond our comprehension. He didn't say to him, and it, and it, and it doesn't say that Rav said that Rav said in spite of that. He says, Torah, oh, all right. It doesn't say they didn't, but but but, but, you, know, but they, you, you see, their their view on it is this is also part of Torah. Eating chalt is also part of Torah. Right? It's, all part, it's all part of Torah. It's all, it's all Torah. The life is Torah. Okay. So one of the cards, so, so what happened? Torah protects. Torah protects from the angel of death. Torah is the, 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 the screen. It blocks them out. Take a look at the last words of the previous parsha. One page back. This is talking about the 
about the, 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 the various, the truma that is given to a coin, and a nine coin is not allowed to eat it. But look at the very last two words of the parsha. Velo samusu, you shall not eat it. Right? Don't, if, you, if you separate the tithes properly, I'm not going into the, I'm not going into the, the last two words say, Velo samusu, you won't die. Now take a look at this parsha. This is the law of the Torah. This is the law of the Torah. So one of the commentaries says, sure, what, what, what's the law of the Torah? The law of the Torah is you won't die. Those chukas the Torah. The, the law of the Torah is you won't die. If you learn Torah, you won't die. Torah protects you. Connected, that's, that's the connection to, from, the, from the previous part. Those chukas of the los samusa, sure you won't die. Why not? Those chukas are, that's the nature of Torah. Yeah, Torah is you won't die. Okay, so now the question becomes like this. Take a look at Rashi. Those chukas are Torah. First Rashi. This is, now what's a hookah, gentlemen? What's a hookah? Not a hookah. A hookah is something else. I'm talking about a hookah. Not a, not, 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 I'm not, you know, I'll give you, it's not like a Russian hookah, it's a hookah. Right? No, no. The hookah, a hookah is a, what is it? It's a statute. A hookah is that thing, you know, you've got, where, where, where five people can sit around being really productive. That's what a hookah is. Right? So five people sit around the room, sit around the room blowing smoke. And that's, that's it. What are you doing? We're chilling. Uh, that's official chilling. Unless you're, I think those are one of the halachas of chilling, right? Hilchas chilling. You have to have a hookah. If you don't have a hookah, it's not chilling. If you don't have a hookah, it's not chilling. So my brother was once in a cab, my younger brother, one well, we don't talk about. And he, uh, you know, he's very, he's extremely, extremely sharp. I told you, if you think, if you think I'm cynical, I mean, this guy makes me. This guy makes me look like a like, like a Girl Scout, you know. <laughs> he, he, he and he's extremely sharp, and extremely quick, and extremely very extremely extreme. And so he he was sitting in a cab, and the cab driver saw that he's got a Haredi in the cab. He said, "Why don't you celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut? You know, Yom Ha'atzmaut is the big. Uh, why don't you celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut?" So, you know, different people have different responses to that. So my brother said to him, did you celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut? My brother first he said to him, how, do, how am I supposed to celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut? He said, well, you know, you go out and you make a, you make a barbecue, you make a mongol. They call it in Hebrew a mongol. He said, you make a barbecue. So my brother said to him, did you celebrate? Did you make a barbecue? He says, yeah. My brother said, did you have beer? He goes, no. Then it's not a barbecue. You're not Yotze. That's not a barbecue. A barbecue has to be with beer. So he got, he got the guy on the defensive. Because he got, you didn't celebrate your Matsuit either. Because that's the official way to do a barbecue is with beer. And, that, and my brother's a master at that. My brother's a master at turning whatever you say, turning it and showing you that you're, that you're wrong. Not that I'm, he doesn't even defend himself. It's not that he defends himself. He takes, he goes on the offensive with, with your equipment. He's, he, he's did, he's did that to me a dozen, dozens of times in the course of a lifetime, which we both learned from my father, who was a master at that. And so he turned, he turned the tables on him. So, so the, uh, uh, good, I got that from, that's all from chukah, right? So he says, what is a chuk? What's a chuk, general? What's a chuk, general, define as? What's a chuk? What's a chuk? Oh, so what's the difference between a chuk and a mishpat? A chuk is generally defined as Laws of the Torah that don't have an explanation, that we don't understand. Whereas a mishpat is laws of the Torah that we do understand. Now the truth of the matter is we don't understand anything, but it could be called, we don't understand anything. But at the end of the day, certain are categorized as being what we call logical, and certain are not. Certain laws are called logical, by the way, if you notice that, that just says musaf on it. That, that, that just says, that's not, I'm not part of a gang, by the way. You know, it's not that I'm part of the Bloods, you know. Yeah, there I am. The, see, that's how they do it, right? Is that how they do the Bloods? Right? Is that how they do it? They, that's, I think they do it. It spells blood when you do this. Somehow, you know, you guys don't know this? This you also don't know? The Crips and the Bloods? They, they do this. That's the thing. You better do like this. If you're in Los Angeles and some guy looks at you, Looks like you, you, if you better put the right sign up there. I, I don't know what the crypt sign is. That why they do it? Bloods like, like that. There you go. Thank you very much. So, so this uh, this is just because I had a, I, I left Shul before Musaf and I had to remind myself to Davin Musaf. And the best place I found when I really need an important reminder, like anniversary, 
you know, I write that down, you know, and I, I write it down on each finger, you know. And so, <laughs> and, you know, well, there's also the inside of the finger, but that has to do with the stuff in high school, but I won't tell you about that. So the, uh, Kaplan, let me see your hands. There, nothing on them, see? <laughs> or, or the back of the neck of the guy in front of me. So the, uh, but I don't want to give away state secrets. So, so a chukah is generally considered a law that does not have logic as we understand it, whereas a mishpat is. A mishpat is. Now, the classic chukah in the Torah, chok, the classic chok in the Torah is the para aduma. The para aduma is the mitzvah that nobody understands. Shlomo HaMelech, who understood everything and knew everything, he said the posik in, in, there's a posik in, uh, either Mishli or Kohelis, I forgot where the Pesach is, I'm embarrassed, but the Pesach says, Amarti Echkema Vihi Rechoka Mimeni. I don't have written down where the Pesach is, I don't remember if it's Mishli or Kohelis. Amarti Echkema, I said I would be wise, Vihi Rechoka Mimeni, yet I've distant from it. We'll try to understand that. The classic mitzvah that is beyond human comprehension is the para? This guy is become ritually impure because he came into de- into contact with a dead body, and so you grind up a red cow, you burn up a red cow, mix it with ashes, and sprinkle it on him. You're you're tahor. Uh, you know, oh, okay. If you say so, if you say so. Well, what's what's one thing got to do with the other? There's actually a medrash that one of the Romans came to the Jew, came to I think with uh, uh, Rev, uh, I forgot one of the one of the Amoraim, one of the Tanaim or Amoraim. And he said, what kind, of, what, kind of hocus, what kind of hocus pocus is this? This guy becomes tell me you sprinkle a, sprinkle a red cow on him, sprinkle ashes on him. So he said to him, did it ever happen to you that somebody was gripped by a spirit of madness? Apparently, they, you know, in the ancient world, this happened also. What do you call it? The, a depression and all these things is not only in the, uh, all in the 20th century. You know, it was happening back then, too. They call it a ruach ra. So he said to them, did it ever happen that somebody was gripped by a spirit of madness by the goyim? Even by the goyim, apparently, they had this. He said, yes, yeah, so what did you do to get rid of it? He said, well, we took certain herbs and we create a vapor, and he breathes in this vapor, and that causes this spirit to leave him. So he says, so listen to what you're saying. You have a spirit inside, and you do something, a procedure to get rid of it. We have what's called a, a person's tummy. We grind out the cow, we get rid of it. So the Talmudim said to him, all right, listen, you got rid of that bum with a flimsy, with a flimsy excuse. You know, what's the truth? He said, the truth is the Torah says a chukah. Yeah, we don't understand it. Now take a look at the first Rashi. Rashi says, Lefisha ha-satan ve-umos olam monin es Yisrael. The satan... And the nations of the world, moaning as he says, is a difficult word to translate. They, they kind of take us to task. They criticize us. Lomar, or they laugh at us. Ma mitzvah azos. What is this mitzvah? Ma time yeshva. What, what, what reasoning is there? Well, what, what is this? Oh, yeah, I can't burn a cow, get the tummy to her. Well, what's going on? Lefichach kosav b'chukah. Therefore, the Torah says it's a chukah. Gzeirahi, it's a decree. Milfani, ain lecharishu saharachara. It's a decree. You have no, no right to be skeptical about it. You have no right to criticize it. It's a law from Hashem. It's a chukah. You don't understand. Now, I'm skipping ahead for a second because there is a logical explanation. Shlomo Melech said it's the one mitzvah that he did not understand. And we're going to see why. Because Rashi later on brings down, in the name of Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan, Rashi says there's a very, very an interesting click. It clicks very well. What does Rashi say? So he says like this. There's a, uh, the Jewish people, <coughs> Adam Arisho, or this always, it always goes back to Adam Arisho, right? Adam Arisho, before the sin, he was going to live forever. What happened? He got messed up. Death came to the world. The world got to the point of Adam Arisho before the sin, which means no death. According to some, it means no death through the angel of death. It means there would have been what's called misas nishika, death with a kiss from Hashem, whatever that is. There are different opinions what it means, no death. But whatever the case is, the world actually re-established the status of Adam HaRishon Kodem Achet before the sin. When was that? When, was the, when did that get re-established? 
When was the world, when did the world reachieve the status of right at Har Sinai? At Har Sinai, the Jewish people actually got to the point there had been no death. Everybody who was sick was cured. Anybody with a broken bone, it was mended. And anybody with a disease was cured. Anybody who had a problem was cured. Any <coughs> White Sox fans came to their senses. Everybody was, everybody was cured at Har Sinai. Everybody came, everybody was, it was, any mental instability over there was taken care of at Har Sinai. Then what happened? The golden calf. The sin of the golden calf brought back death to the world. So what happens if there's death, people become impure. Right? If there's death, people become impure. Now, how do you get out of impurity? A person becomes tamay mace. So what do you do? So the Medrash says, the Rashi brings down, it's comparable and the word, by the way, is comparable, not comparable. Correct, Alan? How do I know? That's right. I lost that bet. So the word, the, you know that? I had a bet with my father. And the word, I said something was not, I said it's not comparable. My father said to me, the word is comparable. I said, no, it's comparable. He said, Kyle, you want to bet? So we bet, and then we looked up the phonetic pronunciation in the, in the Webster's Dictionary. Comparable cost me a buck, right? I've corrected many since then. I should have bet. I should have bet I'd be a millionaire by now. The word is comparable. So the, uh, and I correct people all the time because it's still got to come out of my system. You know, yeah, there's, if I'm going to suffer, you're going to suffer too type of thing. So the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, uh, uh, the, the, the death came back to the world. Now, Medrash compares it to a uh, servant of the king, a maidservant of the king, and she's holding her baby, and the baby soils the floor, right on the floor in the king's palace. Who's supposed to clean it up? The mother has to go and clean it up. The mother has to clean up. The baby, the baby made poopy on the floor. The mother has to be the one to come and clean it up. So the Medrash says, Who's the mother of the, the golden calf? Who's the mother of the calf? Who's the mother of a calf, guys? This you should know. You don't have to be a farmer for this. There's a, a, no, an ox is the father. Good guess there, Shmuel. Right, we're not in Texas, right? What do you call it? This is a, what do you call the, 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 the what do you call the, 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 the mother is, the mother is called a cow. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you didn't know that, did you? In South Africa, you eat them plenty. You got all the meat in the world there. I don't, you didn't know what it's called. You got to know what you're eating. So the mother is a, the mother, and a meat sandwich in South Africa is two slices of meat with a piece of meat in between. That's a, that's a, that's a meat sandwich. He doesn't know what a cow is called. So the, the what do you call the, uh, what you thought, it, oh, you thought the mother is called a biltan. <laughs> that, that's what you thought. You thought biltan comes from a mother biltan, right? That's what, that's what you thought. So the, the, Goodness, grief and gracious. So the, uh, the <laughs> built on. <laughs> I don't know. What, it was just so wonderful, right? It's just so wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, 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 like shoe leather. So the uh, flavored shoe leather with some garlic in it. That's what it tastes like. Except, the, so good. I got that off my. I'm cranky today. Didn't you notice? <laughs> yeah. So the what do you call it? the. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the mother has to clean it up. The mother of the act, the golden calf, the mother is the cow. So the Torah says, what did the, act, what did the calf do? What, how did the calf soil the world that brought death to the world? So who cleans up death? The mother, which is the cow. More than that. Gold, the Gemara says there are seven types of gold. Seven different types of gold. There's yellow gold, there's white gold, there are different types of gold. The finest gold, which is the gold that the golden calf was made out of, is what's called red gold. Do you know that? That there's something called red gold? It isn't literally red, but it's called red gold. So who comes along and clean the red of the mother? The red cow cleans up the gold, the red gold that was soiled, that soiled the world. So there's a, there seems to be some method to this madness, right? There is a connection over here between why the, the, the para aduma should be the thing that's going to sprinkle, and the para aduma, which is red, which represents sin, because the golden calf was sin, and then you burn it and you turn it into ashes and put it in water, which represents Torah, and you sprinkle him. The whole thing makes sense. But at the end of the day, it's called a chok. We don't understand it. What don't we understand? Because later on, 
Which aspect of it don't we understand? So later on, the Torah says what happens. The guy who's involved with making the cow, burning it and doing everything involved, he becomes tummy. Not tummy mace, but he becomes tummy. And the guy he's sprinkled on, he becomes tahar. And that, Shlomo HaMelech said, Ramarti Echkema, that aspect of it I don't understand. Amarti Echkema, I said I would become wise, Vihi Rechoka Mimeni, and it's distant from me. Amarti Echkema, Vihi Rechoka Mimeni. Now, two questions on that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's exactly what you good. You're, you and Shlomo HaMelech are now in the same category. That's exactly what Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest of all men, did not understand. And look, even that isn't difficult to understand, but Shlomo HaMelech said he didn't understand. But we could understand something like that. For example, if somebody needs a medication, somebody's got, an, somebody's got an infection and he takes an antibiotic, it's going to make him better. And somebody who doesn't have an infection takes the antibiotic, he's going to get nauseous from it. So it helps one person and it hurts another person. We have plenty of things in life like that. We're going to come back to that. But I want to tell you an interesting thing on that pasuk. Amarti echkima, I said I would become wise. Vihi rechoka many, yet it is distant from me. That's what Shlomo Mel said. So I want to tell you two interesting insights on that pasuk. <coughs> the first is a question. If Shlomo Melech understood all of the Torah, one mitzvah out of 613, that's a, a pretty good batting average, though. No? You understood the whole Torah except for one mitzvah? That's a pretty good batting average. And yet Shlomo Amal says, it's distant from me? Because you didn't understand one mitzvah, so it's distant from me? What do you mean? I'm Marty Echema. I thought I would, I said, I said I'd become, I see I'm far away from, from understanding. Well, you're far away. I don't know how far you are. You have a 613, 612 out of 613 is pretty good. You call that far, you call that near. I call that pretty near. So why does he call it I'm far? Maybe by not knowing even one line makes the whole difference. Excellent. It tells you how, you know how big Torah is? How big is one mitzvah? You know that the Sefer, I think the Sefer Haredim says, Every mitzvah in the Torah, every single mitzvah in the Torah has so much, inf has infinite depth. So if you don't understand one mitzvah, you don't understand the infinity. That's pretty far. The infinite depth of Torah, the, sefer, the wording of the Sefer Charedim is, if a man would live a thousand years twice, that's his poetic the, boy, the way he puts it very poetically. If you would live a thousand years twice, which is how much, Shmuel? We're on a roll, baby. If you live a thousand years twice, you wouldn't fathom the depth of even one mitzvah in the Torah. Because anything that you could come up with as an explanation, you may be right, but there's more. There are different ideas behind it. What's the idea behind Shabbos? What's the idea behind Kashrut? What's the idea behind Tefillin? There isn't one idea behind it. There are certain ideas which we try to understand. In each mitzvah, we try to understand what did Hashem have in mind here. But just because we understand what he had in mind doesn't mean we understood everything he had in mind. So Shlomo Amal says, one mitzvah that I, if I'm off by one mitzvah, you know, you know you're, you're off by one mitzvah, you're pretty far away. When you say you're closer, you're far. You're, pretty, you're still pretty far away. So you could, you know, you could hit a golf ball. And you can hit it, you know, if you go golfing on a course, you know, you can hit it three times, you hit it a lot, you can still be pretty far away. So that's one idea. But I heard a fascinating idea, another idea. What that means, Amarti many. Sometimes an idea is beyond our comprehension, and we're kind of scratching away at something that's really beyond us. Let's take an example. You ever see art? I don't know the first thing about art. I don't know the first thing about art. I do know enough, though. I was once, I was once in a doctor's office, and he's got, the, you know, every doctor's office, they got these prints on the wall. Nothing, my mom had nothing to do. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been doing this. I actually went to look at the, at the pictures. And so, so I'm looking at the first one. 
I don't know what I was. I wasn't. I, I didn't know enough about the subject whether I should be impressed or not. But I wasn't impressed. Then I look at the name and it says something like Johnson. You know, in the corner, Johnson. Never heard of Johnson. Look at another one. Wasn't impressed. I get to another one. There was something about this one that kind of. I was curious. It actually got me curious. This painting got me curious. And I'm looking at the thing. And I'm trying to pick it. And I, then I look at the corner. Van Gogh. At that point, I understood there's obviously something there, because even I noticed there's something there, even though I don't know what it was I was noticing. But it was obviously something, because then the Johnson and Goldstein, I, there was nothing there. And on the Van Gogh, all of a sudden, then I get to the point where I actually could pick out a Van Gogh now, because of the strokes, the certain type of strokes he has, which is about the, the extent of my knowledge of painting, <laughs> right, of, of, of classical painting. However, sometimes you look at a painting, and what do you have to do? I, you know, I don't really see anything. So what do people do? You look at it, and then what do you do? You kind of, you kind of move back to get a better view, right? Does that happen? Yeah. You look back. Amarti Echema, Shlomo Amelach says, I thought I was smart, and then I realized I'm delving into something that's beyond me. You know what I have to do? Vehi rechoka mimani. I distance myself from it. I step back. At the point that you step back, you're conceding to Hashem that this is beyond me. At that point, Hashem will enlighten you. I step back. What can I tell you? I, 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 I was delving into the Kabbalistic ideas, and I'm clueless. And at the point that I say, okay, this is not for me. So that's my humility saying, this is beyond my comprehension. At that point, I go to work. What happened to Moshe Rabbeinu at the, at the, at the, at the burning bush? What did, Moshe, what did Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu? He said to Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu goes to the burning bush. He says the words, Asurana, I'll move away, and I'll take a look at it. And Moshe Rabbeinu is conceding that this is, the, you know, I got to take a step back. When you take a step back, symbolically taking a step back, that means you're acknowledging, you know, there's a lot more here than I could. Uh, my, 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 my great human intellect Cannot I concede? It's beyond my human intellect. Is that why I said, "Okay, now I can give you a gift." Now you're right. Now you're worthy of understanding it. So the paraduma, the paraduma, even beyond what was the aspect of the paraduma that he did not, that he couldn't get to Shlomo Melch was specifically that that it makes what you were asking earlier that it makes one tame and one tahor. The guy dealing with it, he becomes tame. The guy sprinkled on it, he becomes tahor. That was what he now. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says like this, and this is the proof. Is a, take a look for a second. Let me see what page is on. Take a look further. Perik Lamed Aleph, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, 3121. 3121 is on page uh, 906. Keep the place over here. Go to 906 for a second. The Jewish people have just gone to war with Midian. They've gone to war with the Midianites. And when they're coming back from war, so Elazar Akoin goes out to greet them. You see where it is about eight lines from the top. Vayomer Elazar Akoin Awanshe Hatsova Boyma Mochama. Elazar Akoin goes and he says to the men coming back from war, Zos Chukas HaTorah. Sound familiar? He uses the same expression as here. Zos chukas Torah. Asher tziva Hashem es Moshe. What is the chukas Torah in this particular case? They had captured various, uh, they'd taken the booty from, uh, what do you call it, from the Midianites. And among the booty, there were all sorts of utensils, vessels and utensils that they brought back. And now what do they got to do with it? If you get something from a goy, if you buy something from a goy, what do you got to do with it? You got to kosher it. So the Torah goes on and says, how do you kosher it? Anything that had been used in a fire, you have to put it, you have to burn it in a fire. Anything that had been used, if they used it for roasting in a fire over an open fire, guy. if it was used with water and it was cooking, so you gotta, you got to put boil, boil, immerse it in boiling water. That means everything at the level that it absorbed the non-kosher foods, that's the equal and opposite level that you need to kosher it. So if it was used for, they put it on a spit. 
and put it in an open fire. So what do you got to do with the spit? You got to take the spit. You got to put it in an open fire to kosher it. If they had cooked some, some what do you call it, some, some, some non-kosher food that you cooked it, you got to take the utensil and put it in boiling water just like the, 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 it was cooked. Right? Okay, good. Is that logical? Is that logical? What would you say? Huh? You can't get more logical than that. <laughs> Whatever the equal and opposite is. It absorbed it at, if it absorbed it at a certain level of heat, so you'll get it out with that level of heat. It absorbed it at a lev lesser level of heat, so you'll get it out with it. It's very logical. What expression does use introducing this most? It, this is as logical a halacha from a human perspective as you're going to get in the Torah. It's more logical than tefillin. Tefillin, I understand, it's a badge of honor. But at the end of the day, it's a piece of leather with some parchment in it which sets you back about 1,200 bucks. A lulu of an esra, yeah, it's a symbol. We, uh, we emerged victorious after Yom Kippur and we're poking the sutton in the eye. Yeah, all, it's all nice and good. And honestly, tell it to somebody on the street. Try telling it to somebody on the street. That's what, the, what measures how logical. Tell somebody on the street, yeah, we're burning out what it absorbed with an equal and opposite fire. Yeah, I guess chemistry, you know, they'll tell you all the chem chemistry, uh, uh, that sort of thing. That's logical. What is it introduced with? Zos chukas Torah. This is the statute of the Torah. This is the chukah of the Torah. Back to where, back to the ranch now. What does it say by Parah Aduma? Zos chukas Torah. Anything less logical in the Torah from a human perspective? Is that interesting? The most logical and the least logical, and they're both introduced with what? They're both introduced with Zos chukas Torah. They're both introduced with Zos Chukas Torah. What's the lesson? Uh, Torah does not have to be logical, you just have to follow it. That's what Ramosha Feinstein says. Well, the lesson is that it has nothing to do with human logic whatsoever. It's a Chukah. Even what's logical to us, we're not doing it because it's logical. Even when it's logical, we're not doing it because it's logical. We're doing it because Hashem said so. We're doing it because Hashem said so. And the same thing when it comes to what he called. Same thing when it comes to paraduma is not logical. You got to do it. How about immersing, koshering the kalim? You're not doing it because it's logical. It looks like that's why you're doing it. You're doing it for one reason, because Hashem said you got to do it. And you have to understand that that's why, that's why we're doing it. There may be a logic in where we would be. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has, has, has allowed us to understand this mitzvah. But that's not why we're doing it. We're going to Zos Chukas Torah. Okay, now let's go to your question about... It makes one tame and one tohor. How do, what is the Torah teaching you over there? And this is also Zos Chukas Torah. There's a Zos Chukas Torah. The Torah is teaching you, Mosh, you, 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 I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Shmuel. Uh, Avram, no, sorry. Avram, you asked what? Uh, tame, tohor, tame, tohor, that, that, that sort of thing. So that idea is called. Chukas Torah. That idea is called, but what does that mean? What that means is, number one, the right way to serve Hashem for you is not necessarily the right way for you. What works for you and makes you Tahar could actually somebody else could take it and become Tameh. One person serves Hashem in a certain way when he feels energized, and another guy tries to do that, and he's going to be frustrated. It's all one Torah, isn't it? No. Yes, but no. It's all one Torah. But there are many different aspects of Torah. Let's say one guy enjoys studying Gomorrah, you know, very deep analytical. And he really, you see that the guy's buzzed from it. And another guy says, well, I'm going to try to do that, but his nature doesn't go. His nature is more to accumulate information or to study it from a, hal a halachic uh, uh, approach to learn it la'aloha. You can't look at somebody else and imitate because you're not that person. And what works for one person does not work. It could actually be that one person doing something, I mean, I've seen this in life, where people try, it's like forcing the square into the round hole, or forcing the round into the square hole. I don't know, if I, what's the expression? Square into the round hole, I think. Yeah, that what works for you and that you're energized and you serve God better that way doesn't work for you. For you, Hasidus may work. For, for somebody else, he's allergic to that. He doesn't like that idea of sitting around and singing. 
He wants to, he wants to, 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 to be involved in a book. He wants to be studying something. And another guy who's, who, who, who's, always, who's always studying, and what he needs is a little bit of, a little bit of kogel, a little bit of tish. You know, how much is a different question. But different, there are different approaches for different people. So that's how it could make the same paraduma can make one tame, one Torah, says Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Zos chukas Torah. That's why it's called the rule of the Torah. It's teaching you the rule of Torah is don't look at what the other guy's doing. See what's right for you. I get the guidance from somebody to what's right for you. You have one woman who's a great mother in the home. She loves staying home. It works for women too. A woman's a great mother in the home. You have another woman who stays home, she can go batty. I know women who work, and because they work a number of hours a day outside the house, they're better mothers in the house. They need to get out. That's how they, you know, that, that's, that's who they are. And if I know other women who, who the last thing they want to do, they want to stay home and be domestic. I know chas v'sholem in the Western world today to, to be a housewife, to what they call a, a homekeeper. You know, chas v'sholem, it's, it's, it's frowned upon, you know, chas v'sholem. You have to be a house husband today. Yeah, but that, that's okay. That'll be, that's fine. If you're a house husband, you, we can make elect your president. Right? But uh, to be a chas v'sholem for a woman to do, uh, you, know, you, know, you didn't become a professional? You, didn't, you don't work? We don't work, women don't work for the sake of achieving. They work for the sake of satisfaction to ultimately the main job, which is to be a mother and a wife. They'll do that job better because they get out of the house. And that's a need. Become, other women don't want to get out of the house. They do their job better as a wife and a husband. A wife and a, the most impressive title any woman could get is Mrs. Maybe Rebitson. It's the most impressive title. And Mommy. Mrs. and Mommy, those are the titles. She may be a doctor, and she may be a lawyer, but those are only secondary titles. That's a way of supporting the family so that her husband could learn, or they could pay off, pay off the mortgage, or whatever the needs are. But that's not her main role. Just like a man's main role is not lawyer or doctor, that's not his main role. His main role is to study Torah and do mitzvahs. That's his main role. That is, he needs to support the family, so he becomes a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, a truck driver, I don't care what he becomes. It's not his main role, though. No matter how much people praise you for it, and no matter how, how much it's, it's, it's what he called, it's, 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 it's respected, that, that, that's a distortion. It's not the Torah's view. It's not the Torah's view. The Torah's view is it's necessary to make a parnasa. Not only that, when you make a parnasa, if you support your family, the Gemara says, you're, you're fulfilling the mitzvah of tzedakah 24 hours by supporting your family. But there's no such thing as the title for the sake of the title. The title is meaningless. In the world of truth, Hashem's not impressed. He doesn't care if you got a CPA, and he doesn't care if, you, if you got, you're an actuary. He doesn't care. Did you do your job well? You did your job honestly. You tried to support your family, and that allowed you, and you learned Torah, and you were a good Jew. You did for me. That's what Hashem's impressed with. A woman needs the same thing. But for two women, I know women who work outside the home, and they're better mothers because of that. And I know women who, if they worked outside the home, they come home, they're a nervous wreck because they don't like being outside the house and the rush and, the, and running around. They're better, in the, they're better in the home. They're better. So each person has to find the thing. That's why it's mitame as a Torah, mitame as a Okay, one last idea. Do we have time yet? One last idea. Ramosha Feinstein says there's another reason why it's chukas a Torah. A person, you know, somebody wants to ask me, you hear an interesting question? Are you allowed to be haughty? It's considered an abomination. To be arrogant is an abomination. If you honor somebody, say a rabbi walks into the room and you stand up for him, do you have an obligation to stand up for him? According to Allah, yes. Somebody asks you, why are you allowed to? Are you allowed to compliment people? Why are you complimenting? So you painted that? You, you made that painting? That's an unbelievable painting. It's an unbelievable. You asked the kasha today in Sheer? That's a great kasha. Why am I allowed to say that? I'm putting a stumbling block in front of a blind man. It's going to cause you to become haughty. Why are you allowed to honor people? Why are you allowed to show honor to people? Aren't you putting some? Could I put a, if a, if a man's in a room and he's hungry, could I put a tray sandwich in front of him? 
No, because that's considered lifnei iver lo sitein michshol. You're putting a stumbling block in front of a you're putting a stumbling block in front of a blind man. Why is it that you're allowed to honor somebody? Aren't you putting a stumbling block in front of him? Mirza Shabbat will answer that tomorrow.